For the first time in centuries, researchers have uncovered what's believed to be Jesus' tomb. After centuries of trying to search every corner, scientists have finally found clues showing the location of Jesus' burial place. Inside the tomb, they discovered things that surprised the whole world. So where is this tomb located? What mysteries does it carry that have puzzled scientists for a long time? Is there evidence of Jesus' passion inside the tomb? Or is the body of God inside the tomb? Join us in exploring this video to reveal all the things you're wondering about. Secret at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Have you ever wondered, where is the place of Jesus' death and resurrection? Before exploring the answer, let's take a look at these Bible verses. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ was buried in a tomb cut out of rock just after his crucifixion. Three days later, he awed his followers when he walked out of the tomb alive. So, if it exists in the first place, where exactly is Jesus' tomb? To date, most believe that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem's Old City is the likely location of Jesus' tomb. And in 2016, it was unsealed for the first time in centuries. The belief that Jesus' tomb is located at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre dates back to the 4th century. According to traditional accounts, the church itself was built in the 4th century CE, after Roman Emperor Constantine the Great legalized Christianity, he had sent his mother Helena to look for Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem. Supposedly, she found the true cross, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, near a tomb on the location of a pagan temple dedicated either to Jupiter or Venus. The temple was torn down, with a rock-cut tomb being revealed underneath, which was assumed to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. Beneath, they found a tomb made from a limestone cave, including a shelf or burial bed. This fit the description of Jesus' tomb in the Bible, convincing them that they'd found his burial site. Though the church has been widely recognized as the site of Jesus' tomb, ever since, it's impossible to say for sure that Jesus Christ was buried there. Early Christians were persecuted and forced to flee Jerusalem, so they may have been unable to preserve his grave. To some, the garden tomb in Jerusalem seems a likely candidate. Others believe that the Talpiot tomb in the Old City could be Jesus' tomb. Both are cut from rock, just like the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Archaeologist John McRae says, Although absolute proof of the location of Jesus' tomb remains beyond our reach, the archaeological and early literary evidence argues strongly for those who associate it with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre has suffered over the centuries, however. It was sacked by Persians in the 7th century, destroyed by Muslim caliphs in the 11th century, and burned to the ground in the 19th century. But each time it fell, Christians built it back. And, to date, Many continue to believe that it's the most likely site of Jesus' tomb. The tomb itself was sealed with marble cladding around 1555 to prevent visitors from taking pieces of stone. But in 2016, a crew of specialists opened it for the first time in centuries. Inside the tomb of Jesus Christ. In 2016, the three entities that share the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox and Roman Catholic came to an agreement. Israeli authorities had declared the building unsafe and they would need to make repairs in order to keep it preserved. The powers that be summoned restorers from the National Technical University of Athens who got to work in May. The restorers removed damaged mortar, repaired masonry and columns, and injected grout to hold everything together. By October, they realized they would need to open the tomb as well. This came as a surprise, 
However, workers decided they would need to unseal the alleged tomb of Jesus to make sure that nothing leaked. The researchers also found a second slab of gray marble that they previously did not know about. Engraved on the piece was a cross that may have been embedded by crusaders during the 1200s. The burial bed's exposure offers researchers the opportunity to look at the actual surface of Christianity's sacred site. Initial findings confirmed that there were still present portions of the tomb that had endured destruction, damage, and reconstruction. In fact, the shrine has been damaged by earthquakes, invasions, and fires for several centuries. The researchers realized that they had clear proof that this spot was the same one found by Emperor Constantine back in the 4th century, and that crusaders greatly revered it. Also, during the tomb's opening, religious leaders from Armenian Orthodox and Greek churches, as well as Franciscan monks, were the first to go inside the tomb. They all went out with huge smiles, gracing their faces. Further restoration efforts at the sacred tomb of Jesus have since allowed it to become open to the public. Harris Muzakis, an assistant professor of civil engineering at National Technical University who helped restore the tomb, explained, We had to be very careful was not just a tomb we had to open. It was the tomb of Jesus Christ that is a symbol for all of Christianity, and not only for them, but for other religions. They carefully moved the marble cladding and a second marble slab carved with a cross to access the limestone cave beneath. Then, they were inside Jesus' tomb. For 60 hours, the team of restorers collected samples from the tomb, snapped rare photographs, and reinforced its walls. All the while, dozens of priests, monks, scientists, and workers took the opportunity to take a look inside the tomb of Jesus. We saw where Jesus Christ was laid down. Before, nobody has. Ravid Father Isidoros Fakitsas, the superior of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, to media. He added, We have the history, the tradition. Now we saw with our own eyes the actual burial place of Jesus Christ. Others were equally awed by the experience. I'm absolutely amazed. My knees are shaking a little bit because I wasn't expecting this, said Frederick Hebert, National Geographic's archaeologist in residence for the operation. National Geographic had exclusive access to the church restoration project. Meanwhile, Peter Baker, who wrote about the unsealing for the New York Times, also had an opportunity to go inside the tomb of Jesus. Baker wrote, The tomb itself looked plain and unadorned, its top separated down the middle. The candles flickered, illuminating the small enclosure. After nine months and three million dollars worth of work, the restored and resealed tomb was revealed to the public. This time, workers left a small window in the marble so that pilgrims can see the limestone rock beneath. But whether they're actually peering inside the tomb of Jesus may remain a mystery forever. Jesus' Death and Resurrection we believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried for three days, and rose again. The body of Jesus was placed on a burial bed from a limestone cave side after his crucifixion. Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead three days after his death. Woman who visited the burial site three days later to anoint his body found that Jesus' remains were not there. Thankfully, often what the enemy intends for evil God intends for good. The message of the gospel is one of loving God and loving others through forgiveness and restoration. This situation is in need of an earth-shaking demonstration of love. We need grace and acceptance through the power of the resurrection at the place of the resurrection. According to the scriptures, before the end, there will be a bride, which means community of believers, who is without spot or wrinkle and she will be known by our love. Thus, it is not about being right. It is about demonstrating His love. The fact is, all the proposed locations have several things in common. They are all in Jerusalem. They teach profound lessons and give us a lot to learn. All of these locations are within walking distance of each other. All were outside the city walls in the first century. 
But most importantly, each tomb is empty. Today we sometimes miss the point and are still looking for what Mary was looking for, where the body was laid. Mary was so consumed with this that she didn't recognize the one for whom she was looking. He was standing in front of her, speaking to her in her own language. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. How many times are we desperately seeking the Lord, yet don't see him directly in front of us? The gift of the resurrection is that it happened. When we focus on the location and not the event itself, we are missing the point. This was the angel's message for Mary and applies to us today. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Come to Jerusalem, the city of the great king, and watch your Bible come alive. Marvel at the restoration process of the city, the people, and the land according to biblical prophecy. See where Jesus walked and taught. Yet come with your eyes firmly fixed on the one who lives and not the dead. See what he's doing right now. Hear him say your name and be changed again and again. The Passion of the Christ As you know, God died to save man, and three days later, he rose again in glory. But before that, he had to experience all the suffering and bitterness to atone for humanity's sins. The Passion of Christ, from the Latin patio meaning suffer, refers to those sufferings our Lord endured for our redemption from the agony in the garden until his death on Calvary. After the Last Supper, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives. Our Lord prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew the sacrifice he faced. He prayed so intensely that his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Medical science testifies that people may emit a bloody sweat when in a very emotional state. Our Lord was then arrested and tried before the Sanhedrin, presided over by the high priest Caiaphas. Responding to their questions, he proclaimed, Soon you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. For this statement, he was condemned to death for blasphemy and was then spat upon, slapped, and mocked. While the Sanhedrin could condemn our Lord to death, it lacked the authority to execute. Only Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, could order an execution. The Jewish leaders, therefore, took Jesus to Pilate. Notice how the charge changed. The Jewish leaders told Pilate, we found this man subverting our nation, opposing the payment of taxes to Caesar, and calling himself the Messiah, a king. What happened to the charge of blasphemy? Pilate did not care if Jesus wanted to be a Messiah, a prophet, or a religious leader. However, if Jesus wanted to be a king, he threatened the authority of Caesar. Any act of rebellion, treason, or subversion has to be punished quickly and severely. So Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate could not find conclusive evidence to condemn Jesus. Pilate challenged the chief priests, the ruling class, and the people, I have examined him in your presence and have no charge against him arising from your allegations. When offering to release a prisoner, Pilate asked the crowd about Jesus, What wrong is this man guilty of? I have not discovered anything about him that calls for the death penalty. Even Pilate's wife pleaded with him not to interfere in the case of that holy man. Pilate then had Jesus scourged. The Romans used a short whip, flagrum or flagellum, with several single or braided leather thongs. Iron balls or hooks made of bones or shells were placed at various intervals along the thongs and at their ends. The person was stripped of his clothing and whipped along the back, buttocks and legs. 
The scourging ripped the skin and tore into the underlying muscles, leaving the flesh in bloody ribbons. The victim verged on circulatory shock, and the blood loss would help determine how long he would survive on the cross. To enhance the scourging of our Lord, the soldiers added other tortures, crowning him with thorns, dressing him in a purple cloak, placing a reed in his right hand, spitting upon him and mocking him, all hail, King of the Jews. After the scourging, Pilate again presented Christ to the crowd who chanted, Crucify him, crucify him. Fearing a revolt, Pilate capitulated and handed over Jesus to be crucified. The Romans had perfected crucifixion, which probably originated in Persia, to produce a slow death with the maximum amount of pain. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals. This punishment was so awful that Cicero introduced legislation in the Roman Senate, exempting Roman citizens from crucifixion. This is why St. Paul was beheaded rather than crucified for being a Christian. A military guard headed by a centurion led the procession. A soldier carried the titulus which displayed the victim's name and his crime and was later attached to the cross. For our Lord, the path from the Praetorium to Golgotha was about one-third of a mile, and he was so weak Simon of Siren was forced to assist him. Upon arriving at the place of execution, the law mandated the victim be given a bitter drink of wine mixed with myrrh, gall, as an analgesic. The victim was then stripped of his garments, unless this had already occurred. His hands were stretched over the patibulum and either tied, nailed, or both. Archaeological evidence reveals the nails were tapered iron spikes approximately seven inches in length, with a square shaft about three-eighths of an inch. The nails were driven through the wrist between the radius and the ulna to support the weight of the person. The patibulum was affixed to the stipes, and the feet were then tied or nailed directly to it or to a small footrest, which called supedaneum. As he hung on the cross, the crowds commonly tormented him with jeers. The Romans oftentimes forced the family to watch to add psychological suffering. The soldiers divided the man's garments as part of their reward. As he hung in agony, insects would feed on the open wounds or the eyes, ears, nose, and birds in turn would prey on the victim. With the combined effects caused by the loss of blood, the trauma of scourging and dehydration, the weight of the body pulled down on the outstretched arms and shoulders impeding respiration, the person dies from a slow asphyxiation. Perhaps this is why Jesus spoke only tersely from the cross. When he appeared dead, the soldiers ensured the fact by piercing the heart with a lance or sword. When Jesus' heart was pierced, out flowed blood and water, pericardial fluid. Commonly, the corpse was left on the cross until decomposed or eaten by birds or animals. However, Roman law allowed the family to take the body for burial with permission of the Roman governor. In our Lord's case, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for Christ's body, and he was then buried. As we contemplate Holy Week, we must remember what our Lord endured for our salvation. He offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for sin on the altar of the cross and washed away our sins with his blood. We also must recognize our responsibility to repent of sin. Sinners were the authors and the ministers of all the sufferings that the Divine Redeemer endured. And since our sins made the Lord Christ suffer the torment of the cross, those who plunge themselves into disorders and crimes crucify the Son of God anew in their hearts, for He is in them, and hold Him up to contempt. Our crucified Lord on the cross is a vivid image of His love for each of us. Meditating on His passion will strengthen us against temptation, move us to frequent confession, and keep us on the path of salvation. By embracing our crucified Lord and His cross, we will come to the glory of the resurrection. Others, tombs of Jesus. Which is the real one? There are three tombs in Jerusalem people point to as the place Jesus of Nazareth was originally laid to rest in. One of them is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The others are also in Jerusalem. 
So which one is the real one? Is there archaeological and historical evidence that can provide an answer to this question? Let's analyze the claims of each tomb to see which site is the best candidate for being the actual place where Jesus was buried. The first one is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Another possible location for the tomb of Jesus is the Garden Tomb, as known as Gordon's Tomb. This tomb is a beautiful spot, relatively recently discovered. In comparison to the ancient church, this location was discovered by a British general in 1842, but it was first spotted by Greek landowners looking for water. The Garden Tomb does have some compelling aspects. Archaeology has confirmed it was an ancient garden for more than just flowers. A well, an underground cistern, and a wine press dating to the Second Temple period were all found here. Nearby, there is a sizable family tomb chiseled out of the bedrock. Inside the tomb, there are crosses found dating to the Byzantine period. Not far from here, there is an overlook, although crumbling today, where visitors can notice a rock ledge. Many say it looks like a face or a skull, perhaps marking the place of the skull that the scriptures spoke of. The third location is the Talpiot family tomb. Located about five kilometers south of the old city of Jerusalem is the Talpiot family tomb. It was originally discovered in 1980, but rose to fame with the 2007 Discovery Channel documentary, The Lost Tomb of Jesus. Ten ossuaries were discovered within the Tapiot tomb bearing names such as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. However, scholars have pointed out that the presence of names such as Jesus, Joseph, and Mary is not as compelling an argument as the filmmakers made it out to be. Simply put, they were among the most popular Hebrew names in the first century AD. Finally, the supporters of the Talpiot family tomb have failed to adequately explain the most obvious flaw in their theory. Since Jesus' family was from Galilee, why would they have a family tomb in Jerusalem? Archaeologist Jody Magnus has pointed out that, at the time of Jesus, only wealthy families buried their families in rock-cut tombs and used the secondary burial practice of latter interring the bones in ossuaries. A poor family from Galilee would have used an ordinary grave. Furthermore, Magnus asserts that the names on the ossuaries from the Talpiot tomb indicates that the tomb belonged to a family from Judea, where people were known by their first name and father's name, whereas Galileans would have used their first name and hometown. One of the original excavators of the Talpiot family tomb sums it up. It makes a great story for a TV film, but it's completely impossible. It's nonsense. There is no likelihood that Jesus and his relatives had a family tomb. They were a Galilee family with no ties in Jerusalem. The Talpiot tomb belonged to a middle-class family from the first century CE. Of the three locations mentioned above, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Garden Tomb are the two places that many people believe are the tomb of God. But at the same time, there are many different doubts about these two places, about doubts regarding the Holy Sepulchre. Like with everything in Israel, there are lots of opinions and doubts about both locations. Helena, who built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, was not known for her accuracy in biblical locations. Perhaps motivated by other intentions, Helena often chose biblical locations herself, and she ordered to build churches based on visions of her personal spiritual encounters. The church, along with the city, has been destroyed several times, each time being rebuilt in a different way. Various Christian groups through the centuries fought over it, then lost it, only to regain control and lose it again. Each group claimed to have parts of the true cross and the real holy tomb, this have turned the Holy Sepulchre into more of an Eastern shrine and muddied the accuracy of it. Just because tradition says so, doesn't mean it's the real deal. Now, we're going to talk about conflicts at the Holy Sepulchre. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the family who has held the key for the church for generations is a Muslim family. Simply because the Christians couldn't agree on who should be in charge. 
There is a wooden ladder outside a second floor window right above the entrance. It has been there for well over 100 years, simply over a territorial dispute. Once inside, the church itself houses not one, two, or even three different Christian denominations. No, there are six. Inside, you will find designated chapels and areas governed by Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Armenians, Egyptian Copts, Syrian Jacobites, and Ethiopians. There are clear regulations for when each group has time allocated for their daily services, even more so on holidays. If you brave the crowds during the holidays, you will see signs with arrows pointing in six different directions to each group's true holy tomb. If that wasn't enough, most of them don't even like each other. You can even find videos of fistfights at the church online. Then, let's move to doubts regarding the garden tomb. On the other hand, the garden tomb, while still outside the old walls today, doesn't fare much better. Discovered about 1800 years after the event, the tomb's history is based on a lot of speculation. In the mid-1800s, it was decided that a nearby rock ledge looked a lot like a skull. Soon, excavations found remnants of an ancient garden and wine press from the Second Temple period. By the late 1880s, years after the tomb was uncovered, it was being passionately supported by many Western Christian leaders as the spot. They were using metaphor and typology interpretation of scripture to support their view. While everything seemed to potentially fit the biblical account, the science didn't quite agree. Modern archaeology has determined that the age of the tomb is from somewhere between the 5th, 8th century BC. While the speculative puzzle pieces fit together rather nicely, one of them didn't, meaning this was not a new tomb in the time of Jesus but was already hundreds of years old. The testimony of the earliest disciples is that they had witnessed Jesus of Nazareth alive after his death and burial. They spent time with him, ate with him, touched him, and listened to him teach. For them, the empty tomb and their experience with their risen Lord formed the foundation of their belief in who Jesus was and what he had done. He died to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. The resurrection of Jesus was at the very heart of the gospel they preached and remains the central teaching of Christianity 2,000 years later.